All right, welcome to the Shalom Case and Show. Today we're talking about Mary Lou Williams, who was an American jazz pianist, arranger, and composer. She wrote hundreds of compositions and arrangements and recorded more than 100 records. Williams wrote and arranged for Duke Ellington Benny and Benny Goodman, and she was friend, mentor, and teacher to the Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, Tad Dameron, Bud Powell, and Dizzy Gillespie. And we're going to start with a sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So on, on some of my other episodes, I forgot to start with a prayer. And that's not good, you know, because it's always good to start with God and to end with God. So we're going to be doing the sign of the cross. All right. Let's talk about her early years. The second of 11 children, Williams was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and grew up in the East Liberty neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A young musical prodigy, at the age of three, she taught herself to play the piano. Wow, that's amazing. Mary Lou Williams played piano out of necessity at a very young age. Her white neighbors were throwing bricks into her house until Williams began playing the piano in their homes. That is a strange story. Okay. At the age of six. So I got to comment on this real quick. We don't have to deal with stuff like this nowadays. At the time of this recording, which is 2020, these things just don't happen anymore. I'm not saying that there aren't any problems, but the vast majority of problems that black people had to deal with have disappeared. There's still some lingering issues, but those issues are completely and totally livable and they can be ironed out as time goes on. So some people like to complain and say, you know, things haven't changed much. I mean, if you don't know your history, you just don't know what the truth is. People are not white. People are not throwing rocks into black people's homes just because they're black. That's just not something that happens anymore. And thank God for that. At the age of six, she supported her 10 half brothers and sisters by playing at parties. She began performing publicly at the age of seven when she became known admiringly in Pittsburgh as the little piano girl. She became a professional musician at the age of 15, citing Lovey Austin as her greatest influence. And Lovey Austin was an American Chicago band leader, session musician, composer, singer, and arranger during the 1920s. She married jazz saxophonist John Williams in November 1926. Let's talk about her career. In 1922, at the age of 12, she went to the Orpheum Circuit, uh, what, which is a chain of vaudeville and movie theaters. During the following year, she played with Duke Ellington, who was an American composer, pianist, and leader of a jazz orchestra, which he led from 1923 until his death. He had a career of over six decades. So she started playing with Duke Ellington and his early small band, the Washingtonians. One morning at three o'clock, she was playing with McKinney, with the McKinney Cotton Pickers at Harlem's Rhythm Club. Louis Armstrong entered the room and paused to listen to her. Williams shyly told what happened. Quote, Louis picked me up and kissed me, unquote. So Louis Armstrong um, was an American trumpeteer, composer, vocalist, and actor who was among the most influential figures in jazz. In 1927, Williams married saxophonist John Overton Williams. She met him at a performance in Cleveland where she was leading his group, the Syncopators, and moved with him to Memphis, Tennessee. He assembled a band in Memphis, which included Williams on piano. In 1929, 19-year-old Williams assumed leadership of the Memphis band when her husband accepted an invitation to join Andy Kirk's band. And Andy Kirk was another jazz saxophonist and tubist who led the 12 Clouds of Joy. Um, She went to join him in Oklahoma City. Williams joined her husband in Oklahoma City, but did not play with the band. The group, Andy Kirk's 12 Clouds of Joy, moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Williams, uh, when she wasn't working as a musician, was employed transporting bodies for an undertaker. Now, that's a strange job right there. When the Clouds of Joy accepted a long-standing engagement in Kansas City, Missouri, Williams joined her husband and began sitting in with the band, as well as serving as its arranger and composer. She provided Kirk with such songs as Froggy Bottom, Walking and Swinging, Little Joe from Chicago, Rollem, and Mary's Ideas. So if you have a chance, check out some of these songs. She arranged and composed great music, and she played a lot of great music herself. Williams was the arranger and pianist for recordings in Kansas City in 1929, Chicago in 1930, and New York City in 1930. 
30 as well. During a trip to, to Chicago, she recorded Dragon and Nightlife as piano solos. She used the name Mary Lou as the suggestion of Jack Cap at Brunswick Records. And Jack Cap was a record company executive with Brunswick record, Records who founded the American Decca Records in 1934. The record sold briskly, raising Williams to national prominence. Soon after the recording session, she became Kirk's permanent second pianist, playing solo gigs and working as a freelance arranger for Earl Hines, who, um, who was known as Earl Father Hines. He was a jazz pianist and band leader. She made arrangements for Benny, Good, um, Benny Goodman, who was a jazz clarinetist, and she also wrote songs for Tommy Dorsey, who was a trombonist and conductor. In 1937, she produced In the Groove, a collaboration with Dick Wilson and Benny Goodman asked her to write a blues song for his band. The result was Rollum, a boogie-woogie piece based on the blues, which followed her successful Camel Hop, named for the Goodman's radio show sponsor, Camel Cigarettes. Goodman tried to put Williams under contract to write for him exclusively, but she refused, preferring to freelance instead. In 1942, Williams, who had divorced her husband, left the Twelve Clouds of Joy, returning again to Pittsburgh. She was joined there by bandmate Harold Shorty Baker, who was a jazz trumpeteer, with whom she formed a six-piece ensemble that included Art Blakely on drums. After an engagement in Cleveland, Baker left to join Duke Ellington's orchestra. Williams joined the band in New York City, then traveled to Baltimore, where she and Baker were married. She traveled with Ellington and arranged several tunes for him, including Trumpet No End in 1946, her version of Blue Skies by Irving Berlin. She also sold Ellington on performing Walkin' and Swingin'. Within a year, she had left Baker and the group and returned to New York. Williams accepted a job at the Cafe Society, which was a New York City nightclub open from 1938 to 1948. Um, it, she, she started a weekly radio show called Mary Lou Williams Piano Workshop on WNEW and began mentoring and collaborating with younger bebop musicians such as Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk. And Dizzy Gillespie uh, was an American jazz trumpeteer, band leader, composer, educator, and singer. And Thelonious Monk was a, a jazz pianist and composer. In 1945, she composed a bebop hit in the land of Ubladi for Gillespie. During this period, Monk and the kids would come to my apartment. Er, this is something she said, quote, during this period, Monk and the kids would come to my apartment every morning around four or pick me up at the cafe after I'd finished my last show and we'd play and swap ideas until noon or later, unquote. Williams recalled in Melody Maker, which was a British weekly music magazine. In 1945, she composed the classical influence Zodiac Suite in which each of the 12 parts corresponded to a sign of the Zodiac and were accordingly dedicated to several of her musical colleagues, including Billie Holiday and Art Tatum. She recorded the suite with Jack Parker and Al Lewis and performed it December 30, 31st of 1945 at Town Hall in New York City with an orchestra and tenor saxophonist Ben Webster. In 1952, Williams accepted an offer to perform in England and ended up staying in Europe for two years. By this time, music had taken over her life and not in a good way. Williams was mentally and physically drained. When she returned to the United States, she took a hiatus from performing, converting in 1954 to Catholicism. This three-year hiatus began when she suddenly backed away from the piano during a performance in Paris in 1954. Her energies were devoted mainly to the Bel Canto Foundation, an effort she initiated to help addicted musicians return to performing. In addition to spending several hours in mass, Williams used her savings as well as help from friends to turn her apartment in Hamilton Heights into a halfway house for the poor, as well as musicians who were grappling with addiction. She also made money over a longer period of time for the halfway house by way of a thrift store in Harlem. So this is pretty interesting. So she basically gave up music in 1954, devoted her life to God and to uh, the Catholic Church, and decided to help musicians who were um, who had become addicts because with a lot of the performing and things, they need to they need to be always on and you know always ready. 
and um, they a lot of times use drugs. You've seen this story. A lot of these musicians' stories, they have to, they don't have to, but they end up using drugs because that keeps them at what they feel is their their best capacity for performing in front of people all the time. But of course, it's a lie. It's not good for you. You can be a musician without doing any drugs at all. You can be on top of the world with just, you know, with with just your mind, really. So, you know, you have to be able to become uh, comfortable with yourself and find some means of elevating yourself that is not going to utilize outward materials like drugs or anything like that. Me personally, I go to prayer. I love God. You know, I'm Catholic myself, which is why I find this uh, particular biography of Mary Lou Williams very interesting. I never knew that she was a Catholic, but I go to the church and I go to God in prayer to get my extra energy. You know, I don't really need uh, drugs or anything like that. So um, she also made, uh, yeah, we're talking about the thrift store. So her hiatus may have been triggered by the death of her longtime friend and student, Charlie Parker, who was nicknamed Bird and Yardbird. He was an American jazz saxophonist and composer, and he died in 1955. He struggled with addiction for the majority of his life. Father John Crowley and Father Anthony, who were priests, aided in persuading Williams to go back to playing music. They told her that she could continue to serve God and the Catholic Church by utilizing her exceptional gift of creating music. Moreover, Dizzy Gillespie convinced her to return to playing, which she did at the 1957 Newport Jazz Festival with Dizzy's band. Father Peter O'Brien, a Catholic priest, became her close friend and manager in the 1960s. They found new venues for jazz performance at a time when no more than two clubs in Manhattan offered jazz full time. In addition to club work, she played colleges, formed her own record label and pu publishing companies, founded the Pittsburgh Jazz Festival, and made television appearances. Throughout the 1960s, her composing concentrated on sacred music, hymns, and masses. One of the masses, Music for Peace, was choreographed by Alvin Ailey, uh, who, was an, who is an African-American dancer, director, choreographer, and activist who founded the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And it was performed by the Alvin Ailey Dance Theater as Mary Lou's Mass in 1971. About the work, Ailey commented, quote, If there can be a Bernstein Mass, a Mozart Mass, a Bach Mass, why can't there be Mary Lou's Mass? And I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, with, in the Catholic Church, we have two forms of liturgy in the Roman Rite right now. We have um, an ordinary or a yeah, ordinary form of the liturgy, which is in the vernacular usually. So in America, that's in English. And we have an extraordinary form, which is in Latin. The extraordinary form is locked in the way that it is celebrated. You can only celebrate it exactly the way it's written. In the ordinary form, there's a lot more leeway to do kind of different things. So I really don't see any problem with uh, Mary Lou uh, composing her mass as long as it was reverent and it was, you know, beautiful for God and not for like her own, uh, you know, um, pumping up her own ego or anything like that. And from her life, you know, I can see that she really wrote this music for God and not for herself. So, I mean, I'd like to hear this mass is probably online. I'm probably going to listen to it after this episode. So if you get a chance, please listen to some of her music if you like jazz. OK, Williams performed uh, the revision of Mary Lou's mass, her most acclaimed work on the Dick Cavett show in 1971. And Dick Cavett was um, the title of several talk shows hosted by Dick Cavett on various television networks. Okay, following her hiatus, her first piece was a mass that she wrote and performed was named Black Christ of the Andes in 1963, a hymn in honor of the Peruvian saint, St. Martin de Porres, who was a Peruvian lay brother of the Dominican order, and he was beatified in 1837, and he became a saint in 1962. He is the patron saint of mixed race people. Um, two short works, Anima Christi and Praise the Lord, those are just three of the songs that she she composed for masses. Williams put much effort into working with youth choirs to perform her works, including Mary Lou's Mass at St. Patrick's St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City in April of 1975 before a gathering of over 3000. Wow, that's pretty amazing. It marked the first time a jazz musician had played at the church. 
She set up a charitable organization and opened thrift stores in Harlem, directing the proceeds along with 10% of her own earnings to musicians in need. As a 1964 Time article explained, Mary Lou thinks of herself as a soul player, a way of saying that she never strays far from melody and the blues, but deals sparingly in gospel harmony and rhythm. Quote, I am praying through my fingers when I play, quote, she says, quote, I get that good soul sound and I try to touch people's spirits. She performed at the Monterey Jazz Festival in 1965 with the jazz festival group. So this is pretty interesting. And a lot of people um, kind of wonder what they can do for God, how they can promote the church more. Uh, this is one thing I'm doing, which people wouldn't think it's like, oh, what? You know, um, you're you're just reading biographies off of Wikipedia. That's not promoting God. Well, yeah, you know, I, I read, especially people who are Christians and who did great things for Christianity, and somebody who maybe is not Christian might find it and find something interesting. Maybe somebody who listens to jazz doesn't know, knows who Mary Lou Williams is, but has no idea that she was Catholic. So what Mary Lou Williams did was she played piano for God. And I know some people, my sister's one of them, who plays the piano for God. There's lots of things you could do. You could play guitar for God. You could sing for God. You could just be in your house praying for the world. And that's something you can do. Some people say, well, I don't know. I, you know, I can't get out of the house or something. Who knows what's going on? There's always something you can do. And God wants us to share that love that we have with the rest of the world. If you're just stuck in your house, you're in California, it's on lockdown, you can't go out of your house. You can still pray for the whole world just sitting in your house. And that's a beautiful thing. There's so many things you can do for God. When I was younger, I used to break dance and you know, I, I was thinking about it, man, how could I have utilized that to kind of promote Jesus Christ more? Well, I was just thinking the other day, I don't do it anymore really, you know, I'm, I got older, I'm out of shape, but that's neither here nor there. But for example, somebody could wear a shirt that says, I love Jesus. And if they, they're breakdancing and they win a shirt or a hat that says that, then people are going to be looking like, who is this guy? Or they name yourself after a saint or something. So you're, you're, you could be B-Boy St. Francis or something. B-Boy B -boy St. Peter. Who knows? And you have a shirt with the saint on it or something that says, I love Jesus or a big crucifix. That would be so awesome. Man. And, and you're promoting God through your actions. You don't even have to say anything just by your actions, just by being good at something. I don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but I did want to make the point that it's beautiful what she says here. I am praying through my fingers when I play. That is a beautiful thing. Okay, let's move on. Throughout the 1970s, her career flourished, including numerous albums, including as solo pianist and commentator on the recorded The History of Jazz. She returned to the Monterey Jazz Festival in 1971. She could also be seen playing nightly in Greenwich Village at The Cookery, a new club run by her old boss from her Cafe Society days, Barney Josephin. That engagement, too, was recorded. She had a two-piano performance with avant-garde pianist Cecil Taylor at Carnegie Hall on April 17th of 1977. Despite onstage tensions between Williams and Taylor, their performance was released on a live album entitled Embraced. Williams instructed school children on jazz. She then accepted an appointment at Duke University as an artist in residence from 1977 to 1981, teaching the history of jazz with Father O'Brien and directing the Duke Jazz Ensemble. With, light teaching, with a light teaching schedule, she also did many concert and festival appearances, conducted clinics with youth, and in 1978 performed at the White House for President Jimmy Carter and his guests. She participated in Benny Goodman's 40th anniversary Carnegie Hall concert in 1978. Let's talk about her later years, and then that'll be it. Her final recording, Solo Recital, Montreux Jazz Festival 1978, three years before her death, had a medley encompassing spirituals, ragtime, blues, and swing. Other highlights include William's reworking of Tea for Two, Honeysuckle Rose, and her two compositions, Little Joe from Chicago and What's Your Story, Morning Glory. Other tracks include Medley, The Lord is Heavy, uh, Old Fashioned Blues, Over the Rainbow, Offertory Meditation, Concerto Alone at Montreux, and The Man I Love. In 1981, Mary Lou Williams died of bladder cancer in, in Durham, North Carolina, at the age of 71. Dizzy Gillespie, Benny Goodman, and Andy Kirk attended her funeral at the Church of St. Ignatius, Ignatius Loyola. She was buried in the Calvary Catholic Cemetery in Pittsburgh. 
Looking back at the end of her life, Mary Lou Williams said, quote, I did it, didn't I, through muck and mud, unquote. She was known as the first lady of the jazz keyboard. Williams was one of the first women to be successful in jazz. So she got many awards and honors. She got the Guggenheim Fellowship in 1972 and 77. She was nominated for uh, the Grammy Award for Best Jazz Performance. She got an honorary degree from Fordham University, and she had an honorary degree from Rockhurst College, and she received Duke University's Trinity Award for service to the university, an award voted on by Duke University students. All right, so this is a lot of, of her music here. She just has uh, a lot of different music. And I mean, I wish I could, maybe I can just play a little sampling of something without getting banned by YouTube or something. So let me see if I can do that real quick. Okay, so let me just put my face on here real quick while I search this out. Okay. We're gonna see if we can get a song by Mary Lou Williams and just, just play a little bit of it. I don't even know if the audio is gonna come through. You know what, I need to put it on. Let me put it on this iPad here because I have this connected already up to Mary Lou Williams. I have this already connected up to my mixer. So let's put this back. And there's a picture of her right there. We can look at that while I'm trying to search up something. Okay, so there's a couple of different songs. Which one are we going to pick? Which one are we going to pick? Mary Lou Williams, interview, Mary Lou Williams. Hmm, so many options. Greatest hits, full album. Here's a Zodiac Suite. Here's The Man I Love. Let's play a little bit of The Man I Love. This is The Man I Love by Mary Lou Williams. I don't want to get blocked on any uh, channel, so I do have to kind of talk over it a little bit uh, because they will do a copyright strike. Okay, so that's a little bit, just a little 30 seconds. Go check her out if you like jazz. That is Mary Lou Williams. Williams, and in short, what was her life about? So let's do a quick recap and then see what we can learn from it. So a quick recap, Mary Lou Williams was a musician. She, you know, got, she started when she was very young. She was a prodigy. She was seven years old playing piano and doing lots of different things. I'm looking over here and I should be looking over here at the camera. And she just was uh, always practiced and became better and better. And she composed for many different people. She traveled all around the world performing, but that just wasn't fulfilling for her. She got married and divorced, uh, I believe twice. And all that just, it just, none of that stuff she was trying to do fulfilled her until one day she walked away from music. She found Christ in the Catholic church. And then that's where she found her fulfillment. And she started helping musicians who had addictions and who musicians who were having problems in their lives. And she, you know, did charitable work that way. And then a couple of priests convinced her to come back to the church and continue playing music. So she started writing music for uh, church services and also continued writing jazz as well. So what can we learn from her life? Well, this one's a pretty, pretty straightforward story, right? It doesn't matter what you do in life. We're not going to get our complete fulfillment if we don't have Jesus Christ. If we don't have our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, we're not going to have a complete fulfillment in our lives. And that's one of the main issues that a lot of people have. They get money, they get cars, clothes, whatever, they get fame, but they're just not fully satisfied and they don't understand why. Because we were made to be happy with our blessed Lord in heaven. And we can't do that if we're not paying attention to him at all in this world. So, you know, and some people, uh, of course, I don't know who might be watching this biography or listening or whatever. Um, but you know, there's a thing that I heard somewhere else 
And they were saying, okay, if you've never tried praying or you've never tried this, you never tried that, just try. Just try praying this prayer that if you're not this, that if you say, Lord, um, I don't believe, but help me to believe, basically. That's what you say. Lord, I don't believe, but help me to believe. That's a simple prayer. And if nothing happens, then nothing happens. And you know, you're right in whatever you're doing, whatever. But for me personally, I was not real it, looking at Christianity. It's always Buddhist and everything. And it's, you know, something miraculous happened to me. You can check that out with my autobiography, which is on my website, sdkason.com in the about section. And it was just a total game changer for me. I was not believing at all, not worried about Jesus or anything like that. And it just totally changed my life around, actually helped me with an addiction I was dealing with. So I understand how important the things that Mary Lou Williams was doing are helping people with addiction. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But what can we do? We can just make sure we're becoming closer and closer to Christ as we can by looking at things in our lives, looking at readings. And it's basically a mental prayer. When you look at something and you ask yourself, how can I become holier based on this? These biographies are just, they are biographies, but they aren't just biographies. They're also prayers. They also, the hope is to get you closer to Christ through these biographies by saying, not by starting out, putting us in the presence of God with the sign of the cross, right? Then we read the story and then we think how we become holier based on what the person did. Based on what Mary Lou Williams did, we can know that happiness and we need to live our lives in such a way as that we know the true happiness is in Jesus Christ. That's how we should live our lives. That's how we should go forward and become closer and closer to him as much as we can through prayer, through reading scripture and other things like that. That's Mary Lou Williams. And yeah, it's a great story. And I hope you check out other biographies I have by subscribing. Link is in the description if you're not already on my website. If you are on my website, the subscribe box is below. Um, or you can just go to sdkason.com and check out any of the other biographies I have. And I have church history as well. And everything's over there at sdkason.com. And that's it. So, Mary Lou Williams, I hope you really enjoyed this biography. And until next time, God bless and stay holy. We're going to close out with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See y'all next time. Peace.